Okay, today we get to start on principles of software development. <laughs> uh, this, this topic is so gigantic that, that it's going to be crazy for me to try to describe it, but the thing that I'm going to do is give you three basic rules for how to start essentially any software project. First of all, make the smallest possible thing. Second of all, just do it. And third, document the hell out of it. All right. The things that we're going for always are get the fastest, smallest working model of your software project running as rapidly as you can. Don't wait for anyone's permission to do it. And make it able to be replicated by other people in the future who don't know you and have never talked to you or been trained by you on this code. Does that make sense? Good, okay. So let's start talking first, about, first of all about what it means to make the smallest possible thing. The smallest, and shout out if, if you want to reach me or you, you, uh, you want to message me at all as we're doing this because I've got the little camera propped up pretty high. It seems to be really helpful for the folks that aren't able to make it to class and people seem to like this on YouTube now. So um, if, if I'm being blocked and I can't see your hand, just wave me down and I'll make sure that you, uh, you get to answer or ask your question. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what is the smallest possible thing? How many people in here, and give me a show of hands, have ever heard of a unit test? Okay. Whew. Alrighty. Um, so most of you have never heard of a unit test. Um, the unit test is the smallest possible element in creating anything in software. And it, you start it out intending to fail. The first thing that you do is you, is you create the test for any piece of software that is as small as possible a unit of that software. I am not good at what they call test-driven development. I, I have done some of it, but to be perfectly honest, I'm not that great at it because it requires a certain mindset that flips you from the positive development of software into the negative testing process for software. You write the test like, this piece of software should print my name out. Right? You, um, you, you write a Python script that says, print out the name of the current user for this terminal session. And instead of writing that script, the very first thing you do is you write a test that says, if I run this other piece, this other script, did it print something out? Did it print out a string that seems to match the username for this terminal session? And then you run that, that script it should fail. Does that seem kind of weird to you? That you should write something that is right off the bat supposed to fail? A little strange? A little bit. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little bit weird, isn't it? Why do you think you do that? Why would you do something like that? See what doesn't, doesn't work. Yes, to see what does and doesn't work. Why else? Because it starts you with the habit from the very beginning of testing the things that you code. If you test the things that you code, you can prove that they work. And I don't just mean prove in terms of looking at something and seeing that it works. I mean that a list of tests that successfully execute means that your software is creating, your application is creating the stuff you think it's creating. What you're doing by creating tests first is you're creating a set of expectations that your application then has to live up to. And the reason you start with the smallest possible thing the tiniest possible thing is because you have to add features, methods, whatever, to your applications in order to make it work piece by piece. You'll understand every single piece as you add it piece by piece. You don't write a test that says, is the jigsaw puzzle done? You write a test that says, is this piece foresighted? Is this piece one with a single any and a single outie? You, you test the single piece. You don't test the entire puzzle. Does that make sense? Can you guys give me some examples of what I might be talking about right now when it comes to applications and tests? The smallest possible unit. What's the smallest possible unit you think any piece of software or any application could test? Yes and no. Yes and no. That is an excellent answer to this question. Yes, it's a Boolean. That's, that's actually a perfect answer to this question. The smallest single possible thing you could test is did a thing happen or not? the binary, or did a true or false answer get returned? Not just is the answer to the question true, but did a true or false 
answer get returned when I ran this, this piece of software or ran this script. So that is an excellent example. What are some other very small things you might test? How about something like, um, how would you write a test if you were going to create an application that helped with career matching for every single person in this school? What is maybe, if you wanted to start writing that web application, the tiniest possible thing you could start with? A list of names of people in the school. That's pretty small. I like that, that answer. What would be the test you would write to test whether or not your script returns a list of names? The, the number of names you have match the number of students that it should have? That is an excellent answer. That is one of the, see, and this is not a right or wrong situation. There are multiple unit tests, multiple tests that you can run for each different kind of application or script or piece of, of an application that you're creating. But yes, when I, when I run this, does stuff come back? Yes, good. When I run this, just now that I know the, the total number of people that go to this school, does that match against the number of entries that were returned when I tested for a list of names? That seems like a pretty good test. Right? Testing is, is art as much as it is science. So people that don't understand testing often downgrade it in terms of its, its relative prestige in the software development world. In reality, it is art. It is figuring out what people want to break and then testing versus that, that impetus to break. And it's figuring out the simplest, tiniest possible elements that you can test. So there's a lot of art to it and people that do very good software tests and can write good tests are very much in demand. The, the world of test-driven development is expanding, not contracting. More and more people are understanding that writing tests for something first means that you are intuitively understanding the pieces that you're adding to your application as you go. And successfully running tests means that as you go, you can create whole lists of tests that can be replicated in future for future kinds of applications that are related to what you're creating. There are standard unit tests. Things like, did it return a thing? Is the result binary? Did a result come back that is an integer? There's a lot of very standard tests that you can create that have already been created and you would expect to run them. And then there's ones that you create on your own. Did this application return a result of the form in which I expect? Is the result a JSON or is it XML? Is it a well-formed JSON? Does it form validate? So those are excellent unit tests. So that is create the smallest possible thing and test it as you go. The second thing is don't wait for anybody's permission. When I think of developers, and I, I know maybe, maybe four of them, probably, over the entire course of my software development career, um, I know maybe four of them who truly embody this, this principle, this, this idea. And we often in the, the industry call them a unicorn or a 10x developer. Um, I think it's too quickly applied to people often who have amazing skill sets who can get stuff done rapidly. But I think that the true quality of somebody who is a, um, a 10x developer, that unicorn, that, that special someone, um, is someone who doesn't wait for permission to fix a problem. Who looks at a situation, can intuit the missing piece. Not look at what's there and fix what's there because it's broken, but look at the application and say, there's something missing here realize what it is, and then implement it. That is, that is near miraculous. It's magical when you watch somebody who really understands not waiting for permission to fix something. It means you've, in, you've tuned your brain into the application that you're looking at and decided, there's a piece here that I wish was here. And then you do it. If there is a single thing that I notice as, as an issue when it comes to interviewing and um, and putting teams together for modern software application development, it is this. Developers wait to be told what to do. Do not wait to be told what to do. Make mistakes. The people that, that m the ones that I know of, those three or four people maximum who do this, they make more mistakes than anybody. They make mistake after mistake after mistake. They break things constantly. They, they don't do it in an uncontrolled environment. They break things in development. They don't break it in production. But they break things again and again, and they go figure out why it's broken. Then they fix the broken piece. When you don't wait for permission, when you implement solutions, you will be someone who is on the forefront of the creation of that application. You'll be someone who breaks things constantly. Don't ask for permission. Don't wait. 
just do it. That's what GitHub is for. That's what version control and source control are for. When you have previous versions of your code, break it. Break it as hard and as fast as you possibly can. Do not wait for permission to break code in development. That's how you learn things. That's how you get out on the forefront of the development of an application, and it is certainly the thing that will lead to you becoming someone who is extraordinary in your field. What questions do you have about waiting for permission? Does it seem weird that I'm telling you that? Are you, what's that? It's how you do things on your own, instead of being instructed. It is how you do things on your own, and a lot, remember again, what, I, what I'm trying to teach you right now in this class, if, if anything, is just this. Go look for the answers to your own questions. And if you have a question, as we talked about from the very first day of class, and no one's answering it, answer it for everyone else. Don't wait for permission. Don't wait for someone else to find the answer to your question. That's how you get out front, and it is certainly how you get known for being out front. Any questions? Shout them out. OK. So do the smallest possible thing. Don't ask for permission. And third and finally, document the hell out of it. <sighs> Documentation is, is hard to do well. When I say document, what am I talking about? Keeping track of what you've done. Keeping track of what I've done. What else am I talking about? Um, any little reminders. Little reminders. Yeah. OK, what else? It helps to read the manuscript. Help to, to read the manuscript? It helps to make help to make the manuscript, exactly the docs for it, good. So there are, you, there's a lot of arguments around this, but basically there are two main elements to documentation. One is code commenting and two is the manual, the doc for it, all right? The doc file or readme or whatever your, your um, larger set of documentation is. That larger set of documentation can exist in a lot of different forms. For smaller, simpler applications, it can be something as simple as a readme file that you'll find in GitHub. Often it is created in something we call Markdown. All right? Markdown is a simple way uh, that text editors can interpret the format of what you're typing into a text file. Okay? Um, and it's, it's, interp it's interpretable across many different platforms. But a readme file or a simple um, documentation file is often all that's required for a smaller application. For a larger application, you might find something as complex as a, um, an API or documentation for an API, or you might find an entire wiki devoted to documentation for an application. The, the company that I have, Fizmit, our internal documentation is done on a wiki, but all the code is also commented. There is a test that I like to use, and I say this um, even though it sounds a little heartless, it's the, it's the hit by a bus test. If a developer was hit by a bus tomorrow, would we be able to get access to their code? Documentation is not just so that you can make good code, it's also to protect yourself and the people on your team against total loss of access to the knowledge base that was created by someone. I've actually, and the, the hit by a bus test, I try to do it to make, to make it sound at least a little bit funnier, um, but the truth is, is that I've had a developer die on me before, and I've got, the, the only time that I reached that person was, I got a phone call from his mom. I mean, it was, it was horrifying, and I had lost a, a good friend, but something that was really horrifying to me on not just a, a business but a personal level was a lot of the stuff that he had spent a lot of time creating in his last couple of months, I didn't have access to because I didn't know how to recreate the, uh, the build process that he had done. And a lot of it was either encrypted or in, in partial files. He had everything in his head, so I lost a lot of the work. The, the, the project that we were on lost a lot of the work that he had done. And ultimately, it, it led to problems with the company. So. The reason that we say document, the reason we say comment code isn't just because we want to recreate code in future, it's also because the thing that you're doing is important and no one can read inside your head. No one knows what's happening inside your head. Your intentions for the future need to go in a to-do. Your, your explanation for why you did something the way that you did needs to go in the documentation. And absolutely, certainly, anything that's required to build or access or um, recreate the work that you're doing needs to be documented in either a readme file or wherever you store your documentation in some form that people can get to inside the, the project or the company or the team or the school or whatever project you're working on. Make it so that if you are no longer accessible, and this can be something as simple as you just need, having a family emergency and needing to take off, 
But if you are not available to that project anymore, don't cost them not only your presence, but the, the last however long number of weeks or months or years of your work as well. That's the way that you make sure that you, that you live on in the project, is that your work can be replicated. What questions do you have about that? Shout them out. Does it, does it, it seems kind of weird that I'm talking about this, right? That I would talk about how much you would need to, to protect yourself against needing to leave a project. But the truth is, is that something more simple than that really is just sometimes people get laid off or they have to leave a job. And once you've, once you've been laid off or leave a job, you will no longer have access to or be allowed to touch the code inside a company any longer. And the people inside that company can't reach out to you and say, help us if you're no longer working for that company. That's the most common scenario. And when, you have, when that has happened, it's very common in the software world to, to be laid off and move to another gig, to um, you know, have a project shut down or be moved to another team. And if something like that happens, the people on that team should be able to respect the way that you have left open options for future developers working on that project. Does that make sense? Any last questions? I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads that were good. Excellent, good, okay. Remember, keep options open for the future, not just for you, but everyone else. Okay. 